really. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. I hope you've all had a blessed week. Let's just pray as we start. Father God, we want to thank you for this chance and opportunity that we get to hear your word. Dear God, I pray, Father God, that you would crucify all flesh and let your word be heard. I pray, Father, that everything that is said here would speak to someone, Father, because I know that you are a personal God. Lord, you do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we could ever imagine. Lord, you numbered every hair on our head. You call us by name. Even before we were born, you formed us and you made us with a purpose. So we pray that today, purpose would be exposed, that today, Father God, we would hear your word. And Lord, we pray that in this place, Father God, those that hear your word as they pass by would be touched. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've had a busy week this week. And it feels like it's been nonstop. I started the week, well, the weekend off on holiday with my family. And I don't know if anyone has children, but holidays aren't holidays when you have children. I came back from holiday feeling extra tired and c completely finished. And then we had to go to Leeds. While I was in Leeds, there was so much pressure put on coming from work as well. So after holiday and being in Leeds uh, with the worship team, I get a call on my way back that there is a random CQC inspection and I need to be back in Redford. So to come back from holiday, uh, to be piled with work after going on holiday with the kids and then coming back to an inspection where all your work is going to be uh, looked into and see and they see if it's of standard but i thank god for christ jesus who carried us through uh while i was praying about what i should speak about today i got a word that was cut and i was taken to jesus in the garden of gethsemane uh where he he's about to face the cross and we know the passion narrative where Jesus uh, goes into the garden, he goes in with the disciples, he takes the sons of De Zebedee and uh, Peter a little further into the garden while the other ones rest, and he asks them to wait for an hour while he prays. And we all know the famous prayer that, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Jesus prays the same prayer three times. Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass. And it's always interesting to me that Jesus refers to what he's about to face as a cup. But greater context would, you, would be to understand what was meant by what Jesus was trying to say when he said cup. You see, in those days, kings had armor bearers and cup holders See, the greatest way to kill a king back then was to poison a king. And the best way to poison a king was to put poison within the cup. So normal kings would have a cup bearer who would have the great task of being able to sip any drink before the king sipped the drink. And if the king saw the servant sip the drink and die from the drink, the king would normally not drink the poison after seeing someone die. But our king took the cup knowing that the cup had poison in it. And he chose to drink the cup regardless of the pain that he was going to face. So I was thinking a lot about cops. So I've titled this sermon, 
cup for those who are taking notes. And I don't know about you, but I believe that there are so many different cups that we face throughout life. And I, I want to turn the word cup into an anagram. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write cope under pressure. Cope under pressure. And I believe that this is the great mystery of life. It's so easy to do things when we're not under pressure. I'll give you an example. Some of the greatest singers in the world remain in the bathroom because of the pressure of being seen in public. Some of the greatest business ideas are stuck behind those who do not want the pressure of being uncomfortable enough to elevate themselves to the next level. You see, the thing with pressure is, it does not respect gift or talent. When you feel pressure, you forget your value. And I believe that pressure is one of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses for us to fulfill, forfeit our purpose. You may know your value, but if you don't believe in it, you will always buckle when it comes to pressure. Some of our greatest failures come when we're under pressure. You see, when you squeeze a fruit, what is yielded is what's inside it. And as we navigate life, we have to navigate life with the idea that when pressure comes, am I still the same person? Dare I say, it, I think the real, who we really are only comes out when we're under pressure. And I know it's cliche, but refining gold requires fire. Creating diamonds needs pressure. And you know, when, when, when you put it in parallel with what we see happening in the Garden of Gethsemane and what we see, what we read in John 3.16, where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We really get a picture of the pain, the anguish that Jesus was about to face. But regardless of the pressure, regardless of the pain, he knew that if there was no other way for the purpose to be fulfilled, he was still willing to do it. Three times Jesus prays. And I want to believe that each time Jesus prayed for us for over an hour. We see the disciples fall asleep and I can, I can attest to, 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 to being like the disciples <laughs> where the Lord is telling you to pray and he's asking you to stay awake with him, but you find yourself too tired, yet you're not the one who's about to go through the pressure. I believe that the Holy Spirit is raising up a people who will be genuine through and through. You see, sometimes the pressures of society allow us to be desensitized into what should happen when we are squeezed. As a believer, when we are squeezed, we should never change. You see, you read out throughout the New Testament and you read about the life of Paul. He was a man who was constantly under pressure, but pressure did not defeat him. It did not deplete him, but it drove him to his destiny because he understood the only way to be purified was to learn how to deal with pressure. 
Some of us can't deal with the pressure of being in traffic and someone cutting us off because boy, when that pressure comes, we fail within an instant because what comes out of us is anything but what should come out of a Christian. Some of us buckle under the pressure of temptation because the devil knows if I wave this in front of their face, they will buckle under the weight of pressure. Let's go back to this cup. You see, Jesus knew the cup that he faced. He knew how to cope under pressure. But regardless of him knowing how to cope under pressure, he gave us the blueprint of honesty and integrity. Even the savior of the world cried out to God when pressure was put on him. See, there is a paradigm that is eclipsed within the gospel when you come to dealing with Jesus. Because Jesus was not merely man, but he was also God at the same time. So when some of the things we read in the Bible, I believe that they were intentionally detailed so that we would have some foresight on how to deal with the strategies of the enemy. Imagine being in the place where you know that you are going to be betrayed. Not only betrayed, but betrayed by one of your own. And this betrayal would not only lead to embarrassment, but it would lead to death. And this betrayal would, would ultimately lead to excruciating pain and anguish. And all throughout your ministry, the very person that was going to cause the anguish, the pain, was walking alongside you. Imagine living with the foresight of knowing that those who were going to betray you were among you. Would you still be able to walk and do life with those that you knew were going to betray you? Could you cope under that pressure? Because the greatest offense ultimately comes from betrayal but still we see the grace of God because Jesus didn't just die for the world. He also died for Judas. I believe that the Bible is very intentional about what is happening when we read the passion narrative. Not only do we see betrayal, not only do we see pain, hurt, not only do we see greed, not only do we see that money drives people into insane positions, but we also see grace and love personified. We also see that Jesus was not just a man, but he was a God who forsook his death. So he could have never been killed, but he gave up his life. I think this is one of the greatest lessons that we can learn as believers because without understanding how to cope under pressure, we'll forever forfeit our destiny and our purpose to the reaction of this world. See, constantly as we walk throughout life, we are pressured in three paradigms, in three, in three, at three different places. We have the world that pressures us. We have the enemy that pressures us. And boy, as if those two weren't enough, we also have flesh that pressures us. And for too long, there's been a teaching that discipline is the key element of how to overcome the world and overcome your flesh and overcome your desires. But boy, has the church been gravely mistaken. When we think discipline has any match against the powers of hell, when we think that discipline has any match against your flesh. Today, I wanna to tell you that 
The only way to overcome the world, to overcome the enemy, to overcome your flesh is by submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because as humans, we hold no strength outside of the one who says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So when Jesus says all authority in heaven and in earth belongs to him, God is not a man that he should lie. It means that there is no other authority left for anyone else, either in heaven or in earth. So every authority now belongs to Christ. And for you to partake in this authority, it is only through him and by him. There is no level of self-discipline that will leave you. Well, it will lead you to self-righteousness. It will lead you to, to gratification for the moment. But if you want to constantly live out and walk out your Christian life where it does not depend on you and it fully depends on the Holy Spirit. See, the only time you burn out is when you come out of faith in Jesus. When you begin to do things in your own strength, that's when you begin to burn out. That's when you begin to question God. That's when you begin to find yourself trying to pass the cup on. But when you realign yourself back with the word, and you realize that the will of God is greater than the will of man. When you realize that the purpose God has for you is eternal, but the destiny life has for you has a time limit. See, it's so scary to think that we live to the pressures of society rather than living and, and, and being obedient to the will of God. See, society would put pressure on you to be perfect before you save, serve God. There is things that you have to do by a certain age for you to be someone in society. Your tax bracket has to be a certain amount before anyone can listen to you. Yet the kingdom of God says, serve, humble yourself. The world wants you to increase. The word wants you to decrease. When we learn to cope under pressure, we no longer live according to the stresses and the ideas that society throws on us. Ideas like, why don't you have a child yet? Don't you need a degree to be doing this? You're getting quite old. Why are you not married yet? See, if any of these things are outside the will of God, they mean nothing to you. And when we go from coping under pressure, there is a next level that surpasses the coping under pressure. We now graduate to confidence under pressure. See, I believe that Paul was a man who was confident under pressure. But if you read the story of Paul, you hear about this old man who, who with these young guys get shipwrecked. And when they get shipwrecked, they're washed up on an island and the young guys are grouped together, uh, not knowing what's going to happen. And they're cold and scared. Uh, they see Paul. Paul begins to, he just gets up. He wipes his feet confidently. And he begins to make a fire in the, in, 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 uh, on, on the seashore. While he's making this fire, he's bitten by a venomous snake. And he doesn't run or scream, but we see him shake this rattlesnake into the fire and just continue with what he's doing. Because there is something that happens when you are confident under pressure. 
because comes sickness or disease, if your purpose is not fulfilled, there is nothing that the enemy can throw at you. There is no weapon that can be formed against you that has the ability to prosper. Because if God has not said it, it's time, there is nothing that can happen to you. See, we run away from this. The confidence that I have in Christ is not in my ability to save him, serve him, but it is in my ability to know that the one who served me will see the work through into completion. See, we are so racked up on perfection and our idea of what a Christian should look like, what a righteous man should look like. You see, if you're so wrapped up in that idea, you begin to put yourself in this bracket of, 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 of someone who has laws that they have to live up to. And, and the devil would desensitize you and make you believe that you are not self-righteous. And you, in fact, you are doing the right thing. But I am here to tell you today that Subtle pride can lead to our greatest falls. See, to him who is able to keep you from falling, we're talking about God. God is the one who will sustain you and keep you only if you surrender to him. We believe that we have one of the greatest parts to play in this play. And that's where we get people worshiping men, following men, because they believe that another man possesses something that they do not have. And this is brought on by pressure that society puts on us. You hear someone prophesying, someone using their gift, and you believe that gift is brought on by righteousness or something that they have done. Ultimately, when a gift points to itself, it ceases to be a gift or a blessing, and it curses the man that wears that gift. Church, the greatest gift we have is salvation. Salvation is final to the one who accepts it and works with it and lives in obedience to it. Pressure will come from the world, the enemy, and our flesh. But we need to be confident in the one that saved us and began this good work. Even he went through a time where he was under pressure, but his confidence was in the mission and the purpose he had. Even in times of pressure, the Holy Spirit is ever present. His fruit is there. We need to be a people that are driven by the grace of God. We need to understand what the grace of God means to us. Because if we don't understand our position in all of this, we'll forever devalue the gospel and the power of the cross of Calvary. I have been... I remember when I was in Bible college, I had a friend who was infatuated by the idea of the grace of God. In fact, we used to mock him and call him the grace preacher. And looking back now, I realized that that, 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 that guy had one of the closest relationships with the Holy Spirit any man would have. See, as believers and religious people, we ultimately want to believe that there is something we must be doing to receive the love of God. Yet even while we were still sinners, 
the love of God came to us. See, you did nothing to deserve his love. His love is unconditional, agape love. It needs nothing to love you. Now, our greatest battle is understanding that this love that needs nothing for me, how do I receive it? When the way that I have experienced love in the past requires something of me. And leaders and pastors and deacons and elders, I encourage you to look into this love that is fueled by grace. Because when we understand the grace of God, not just through biblical eyes, but we begin to experience the grace of God. We can no longer be in shackles. We can no longer feel the pressure because it is the love of God that moved Christ from the heaven for God so loved the world. It is the love of God that sacrificed his own son. And it is the love of God that on the third day he resurrected. And it is the love of God that one day he is coming again. And it is because of the love of God we stand here today, even though we are not worthy of his love. We did nothing to deserve it, but it is because he loves us first. We stand, we speak. It is not because of our credentials on a piece of paper. It is not because of our character. It is not because of what we have done it is because of the love of God. And I plead with you when the love of God begins, the, begins to be the foundation of everything we do. Get me right. Character built upon the love of God is powerful. But when character goes before the love of God, a fall is surely a, in the future. Does anyone know how long it took Noah to build the ark? I was reading this the other day and I was completely blown away by the idea. You know, as a kid, we read this story, we read these stories of Noah and the ark and the two of each animals. And, and, and it almost feels like everything just happened in, in a couple of weeks, he built this art, people watched and they laughed. And it was, do you know that it took Noah 120 years to build the ark from the time the word of God came that there would be a flood to the completion of the ark was 120 years. Some of us will never experience what it means to live to 120. Never mind being faithful for 120 years to an idea that God has put in you. Imagine the constant pressure Noah was under. Building for 120 years. <coughs> wood by wood, block by block. Imagine the family looking at this man in drought, there is no rain coming. And he's saying, family, let's build this ark. For 120 years, Noah stayed faithful. 120 years. Now we flip that and we realize that for 120 years, every man that walked <coughs> had the opportunity <coughs> to react to the message. For 120 years, the grace of God was prevalent in the Old Testament. 120 years, they had the opportunity to repent. 120 years, God said he was going to send a flood. And I was taken away by the love of God because the sin that had covered the earth, yet God had the patience to wait for 120 years so that he could <coughs> save those who listen. I'm going to close on this. 
that just like the days of Noah, we stand with the opportunity to be faithful to God, to be able to tell people there is rain coming, a flood is coming. Yes, there's pressures. People will look, people will laugh, people will ridicule, but it is because of the love of God we do what we do. It does not have to make sense. Imagine we are not called to build an ark but we are called to demonstrate the love of God, to show people what it looks like to be loved by God, to walk in relationship with God. But pressure constantly makes us forfeit the mission of God. 120 years. I, I want you to walk throughout this week to think God was patient we often think when we read the old testament that the wrath of god was prevalent and when sin was abounding god would send fire but god was patient then and god is patient now but there is a time to all of this we are called to patience. We are called to love. We are called to, 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 to bring out the fruit of the Spirit in us. But church, there is pressure that is on our backs. And we can choose today to cope under this pressure or we can be confident under this pressure. Just like in the days of Noah, there was 120 years. We are also racing against the clock. We also have this pressure upon us that we know that there is a time where the wrath of God will be released. And it is the love of God that we have been rescued. It is because of the love of God that we have been given This grace is because of the love of God that we've been given this opportunity. And if we do not share that same love that God has given and extended to us, can we really say that we understood the love that was given to us? We have been loved so that we may love. We have experienced the grace so that we would extend the grace of God to others. So as you go throughout your week, ask yourself, am I coping under pressure? Can I be confident under pressure? And can I extend the grace of God to my neighbors, to my colleagues, to other students within the school? Because Great is the gospel for us to hear, but better it is to share the gospel with a brother because it is the good news. It is the redemptive message of our Father. So I'm going to pray as I close. And I, I am aware that it is Sunday, so we're taking the communion. So as we take this communion, let it be something that pushes us out. Father God, we want to thank you for today. We thank you, Father God that Lord, you are constantly building in us. You're constantly restoring in us. You are showing us how to cope. You are giving us the confidence to stand on your word. And Lord, we know that when the enemy brings pressure, when the world brings pressure, when our flesh brings pressure, we can run into your arms knowing that it is finished and all authority in heaven belongs to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.